So there was an evil guy named Antiochus Epiphanes or Epiphanes, and, and that meant, he actually named himself that, and that meant God manifest. This guy was evil. Well, he had a bride, and her name was Laodice. Well, the town of, or the city of Laodicea was named after Laodice. So she was Laodice the fourth. He was Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. And, uh, or Antiochus IV, he named himself Epiphanes. But this guy was so evil. Well, today we're going we're gonna to be looking at the book of Revelation chapter 3, the last of the seven churches listed and given letters to by Jesus. And we're going to look at how evil this Laodicea church really is. All right. Hey, if you haven't subscribed yet, if this brings value to you, you want more of this kind of stuff, hit the button down below, hit the little bell too, and you'll get all the latest episodes. All right. So let's go into it right now. So verse 14 in chapter three of Revelation, and Jesus says, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. So here, this is the church in Laodicea. And again, Laodice the fourth. She was the bride of this antichrist type, this guy named Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes, and that was who she was married to. It's weird too because she was like his brother. So Laodicea was named after Laodice. So here's an image of this guy. He was very evil, and. Uh, you could just see it, right? Even on this image, you could just see the arrogance here. And this guy named himself God Manifest. That's what Epiphanes meant in those days, which is kind of weird because we had a president who used to say it's like an epiphany all the time. But this guy would do that. The Epiphanes meant God Manifest. And I think he put it on one of his coins as well. All right. Well, so let's continue on and and uh, look at this letter to this last church. Remember the church before this one, the Church of Philadelphia, which meant brotherly love. I believe that that spoke of a phase in church history of uh, like Billy Graham, C.H. Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, like these revivals that have been going on, like the 1800s and 1900s in the early 2000s. And I believe that that church in particular, that phase or movement, that, that that particular phase of the church history should be raptured or caught up to be with the Lord because they're spared from the hour of trial, which means tribulation that comes upon the whole face of the earth. That's when, when God says the whole, the whole earth, the whole earth is different than just tribulation that you'll see in a particular spot, right? So that's what we see here. So this guy right here, very antichrist kind of a guy. All right. And he was actually around 160, um, like around 168, 170 uh, BC before Christ. And he basically, he killed thousands of Jewish people. He was very angry. He went up, up into uh, Jerusalem and he he just like d just killed just made all these new rules and killed thousands and thousands of Jewish people it was horrible and then some of the Jewish people uh you know this is where we get the Maccabee story the Maccabees revolted against this evil guy and his you know heretical priests these these phony priests that were following him which is where we get the Sadducees from they actually came from that um, yeah, whole Hellenistic uh, style of being a Jewish priest, which is wrong. And that's where we get the Sadducees who hated Yeshua, right? Jesus. They hated Jesus. So that's what we see here, this guy. And this is how evil this guy is. So Antiochus Epiphanes, or Epiphanes, the fourth Epiphanes. The Maccabees renamed him. This is really funny, guys. They renamed him Epimenes, which means the mad. So Antiochus the Mad is what they named him. And it was a wordplay on his epiphanies, which meant God manifest. I love that these guys had the courage to even mess with this guy. They weren't afraid of him. And uh, they called him the Mad, Epimenes. <laughs> oh, man. So Antiochus IV the Epiphanes, he contributed money to the Temple of Zeus. Remember that episode we did on Pergamum? 
the, to the letter that Jesus wrote to, or had John write to the church in Pergamum. Remember, that was where Satan's seat was, and it was dedicated to Zeus. And we know that the Nazis used that, that whole layout of Pergamum for their horrible place in Nuremberg, where they had those satanic uh, meetings. And uh, Hitler's podium was put right in the place where the altar to Zeus was in Pergamum, in that Nuremberg place. So there's a lot of connections there. So this guy contributed money to Zeus. He was all about that. And then here in Daniel, okay, Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, it says this. It says, and from the time, and remember, Jesus quoted this about the end of time. This is what he quoted, okay? And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So what's 1,290 days? That's three and a half days years. So what a lot of scholars teach is that that means the halfway point in that seven-year period called the tribulation period, that this would happen, this abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, just as Jesus said. And a lot of people will say that um, this was fulfilled with that Antiochus fourth Epiphanes, this Antiochus guy, right? which it partially was, um, he, he actually did a seven-year covenant as well. And he, in the middle of it, he set up this abomination, which was, according to history, an image of Zeus, maybe a statue of Zeus or something in the holy place in the temple. And he wanted all the Jewish people to, to bow down and worship it. And that was the end of his thing, by the way. Um, the, the Jewish people weren't having it after that. But so that's... In history, a lot of people say that, well, that was fulfilled. And this guy, you know, like in 163 or 64 uh, BC before Christ. Well, he was a type and a picture of the real Antichrist, which is to come. Because Jesus was talking about a future event when he quoted this from Daniel chapter 12. So it shows us that, you know, it's kind of like how Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ. Moses was also showing us a type or when uh, Abraham and Isaac were going up the mountain and Isaac had the wood on his back, that was showing us a picture of the crucifixion. There's a lot of, God does that. He loves to give us stories and images and portraits and pictures and biographies and, you know, and prophecies, especially, you know, all this stuff pointing to what he's going to do in the future. So these types of Antichrist, I believe Antiochus Epiphanes was a type of the Antichrist. I also believe that his wife, Laodice the fourth, very evil woman, I believe that she was a type of the Laodicean church because the Laodicean church is half in and half out. They're believed they're 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 sucked into the evil, and then they also, you know, they want the good too. And and Jesus says, no, you have to choose. So we're gonna look at that in the scriptures. So let's move on in these scriptures. So let's look one more time. You know, Antiochus I wrote up right here, but I put Antichrist Epiphanes, because that's what he was. He was like the Antichrist. He was a type and picture of him, a portrait of what to expect in the future. But we don't look for Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. All right, so the church in Laodicea. So it's chapter 3, and this is the last part of chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And I believe in the phases of church history that speaks of today. All right, I think this church is around today. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the church today, you guys. Um, the whole thing about, you know, the gay marriage and and the just all of that that that's creeping in how they have a lot of these churches hate Israel they want to promote the BDS movement which is evil that means boycott divest and sanction against Israel they they don't think that God has anything left for Israel they think that God has nothing to do with them they're totally wrong about that and I, I'll even point out it's some of the United Methodist Church some of the Presbyterian churches doing this. Uh, just some of these other churches, and they 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 hate Israel. They're anti-Semitic. It's wrong, and they're halfway into this evil, and then they're trying to also follow Jesus, and it's no good. But there's a lot a lot of these Methodist churches, some of them, and some of the Presbyterian churches that don't fall for that. So some of them are fighting against that, and they're staying true to the Word of God, which would make them a little more like the Church of Philadelphia, right? All right. So that's what we see there, you guys. 
in in phases in church history. So here's that uh, timeline again. Remember the Church of Ephesus, Church of Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, uh, the church in, in Sardis, and then in Philadelphia, the one that's caught up to be with the Lord. They're spared from that hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole earth. And then we see the church of Laodicea, and I believe that's today all the way to and into the tribulation period. All right. So this is how it starts. Jesus says, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. So that doesn't mean, and some people will say, well, oh, see, that means Jesus was created. That's not what it means. It just means he was there creating with God, if you do the research on the words of that meaning. So verse 15, I know your works, Jesus says. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, right? A mix of cold and hot. And neither hot nor cold. He just interpreted it. I don't know why I didn't say anything. I will spit you out of my mouth. So Jesus here is saying, I'm going to vomit you. And that's literally the translation. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you're neither you're neither cold nor hot. And uh, I don't know if you've had a a cup of like lukewarm coffee. It's disgusting, right? Or even lukewarm water. It doesn't taste good. (laughs) So that's the idea here. And I believe it's because they're mixing evil uh, with good. They're trying to mix them together. So cold. Here in the Greek, this is the Greek that was used in the writing of Revelation for that word cold. And it is uh, sucros. And that's how you pronounce it. And it means chilly, sluggish, inert in mind. So almost like a, a, a love that's gone waxed cold, right? Uh, you know, like when a candle, the, the fire's not burning anymore on a candle, the wax grows cold and hard, like a hard heart, right? But when that fire's still lit, the wax is soft and it's warm and there's a tender heart, so to speak. And that's what you want. So this last lampstand, part of the seven golden lampstand, this last one, it's like half of it's burned out and cold. All right. So that's what we're seeing here. So that's what Jesus was speaking of when it, when it says cold. And you're and he says, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So hot means zestos in, in, in the Greek. That's the word that was used. And it's a fervor of mind and zeal, right? That means they're they're on fire for the Lord. You're you're like that road to Emmaus, those two men, their hearts were burning with God's love, right? The Holy Spirit burning in their hearts. It's like that fire that didn't consume the, the bush when Moses saw it. That's God's fire, and that's what we need. We need his his fervor and, and his mind and his zeal living inside of us. The Holy Spirit provides that for you. So that's the idea. We want to be hot. We want to burn hot. Our hearts burn hot for the Lord, you guys. All right, so let's look at some more scripture here. For you say, I am rich, and I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself. And the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. So Laodicea was known for its eye salve. This is eye medication that they had, this ointment, and uh, it was known for it. It was very valuable in this time. So Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you some of my eye medicine, my ointment, that will be poured forth and that will cause you to see so that you could be saved. And if this speaks to your heart right now, if if you've never known Jesus and you'd like to know him and be born again and follow him and be saved, you're going to have that opportunity in a few minutes at the end of this episode. And if you want to recommit your life to him, if you feel like you've been lukewarm and you want to recommit your life to him, you can say that prayer as well, my friend. All right, so we'll do that at the end of this episode. Okay, so verse 19, those whom I love, Jesus says, I reprove, I correct. 
and discipline. So be zealous, there's that word again, and repent. So be hot for for the truth of God. We want to burn in your heart and repent. That means turn, turn to Jesus. That's what that means, you guys. And then verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. That speaks of fellowship, guys, abiding. And here's this famous painting where Jesus is knocking. There's no handle. If you'll notice, no handle on the door because the handle is on the inside. You have to open it. God is not going to force his way into your life and your heart. He is a gentleman. And the Holy Spirit, he will knock on the door to your heart, but you must open it and let him in to be saved, to follow Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. So you must open the door to him if you want to be saved. So, So he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He knocks. Do you hear his voice? You must open the door. And then verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you hear what the Spirit says, my friend? He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's what he's saying to you. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. I'll have supper with him. I'll have dinner and and, and, and a meal with you, he's saying. That's a, like an abiding term. We'll abode together. We'll live together. You'll have a relationship with me. That's what that means. All right, my friend, so if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you sense the knocking on the door of your heart right now, the Lord might be gently knocking, the Holy Spirit leading you to follow Jesus, to give your life to him, you can do that right now, my friend. You can receive him through a simple prayer just by repeating the words after me. You're praying from your heart to God, to the Lord. It's business between you and him. You're not praying to me. So stop what you're doing. If this speaks to your heart and you would like to receive Christ right now and be born again and say this prayer, repeat it after me. All right, here we go. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. I choose to turn from my sin Please help me to do that. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe he shed his blood for me. And I believe that in three days, he rose from the dead and he's alive today. I choose to follow him as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, my friend. Hey, this is the greatest day of your life if you did that. If you recommitted your life to the Lord, hey, a blessing to you, my friend, as well. All right. Well, God bless you guys. Hey, make sure you're going to a Bible-believing, teaching church or fellowship. Make sure you're getting good fellowship with other believers. And also make sure you're reading your Bible and praying every day. Well, God bless you. Hey, we're going to go going into chapter four next time. We're going to be looking at this open door into heaven as John goes right into and gets a vision of what heaven looks like. It's amazing, you guys. Looking forward to it. If you haven't subscribed, hit that button down below. Hit the little bell too. You won't miss anything. If this brings value to you, please consider subscribing. All right, you guys. God bless you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you and give you peace. Amen.